Come in and pick your favorite queue if you have one. Gentlemen, I've just arrived from Richmond. And I've been asked to convey to you an account of some events of the past months. In the month of last June, I received a message from Speaker Peyton Randolph that we, the Virginia Burgesses, having been dissolved by His Excellency Lord Dunmore the previous May, were to meet in Williamsburg in August to consider actions against Great Britain. Mr. Randolph's letter concluded that things seemed to be hurrying to an alarming crisis and demand the speedy united counsels of all those who have a regard for the common cause. I repeat it, gentlemen, the common cause. It is no simple task to which we have pledged ourselves. For the last decade we have struggled with the ministry in Parliament, but to what length shall we go to preserve a union with tyranny? As our friend Colonel George Washington has said, no one should scruple or hesitate a moment to use arms in the defense of liberty. I repeat it. Liberty. <laughs> what one word better defines our common cause? My thoughts were upon those things as Colonel Washington and Ed Pendleton and I journeyed together to Philadelphia. We were chosen in Williamsburg as Virginia's delegates, along with Peyton Randolph, Rit Lee, Dick Bland, and Colonel Ben Harrison, to the Continental Congress held the first Monday of September last. Uh, we had a memorable first evening in Philadelphia at Smith's New Tavern with a delightful supper and many toasts and introductions to numerous gentlemen, many of whose names I cannot remember. I gained new friends there. I have particular admiration for the Boston cousins, John and Sam Adams. My Quaker friend, who you all know, Robert Pleasance, was very kind to send along letters introducing me to many prominent Philadelphia Quakers, whose hospitality I was very fortunate to enjoy. Our first evening was spent in the home of Mr. Lee's brother-in-law over much discussion. The following morning after a gathering at the tavern, we made our way to the newly built Carpenters Company Hall, where Mr. Lynch of South Carolina proposed that we sit in the East Room and then promptly nominated Mr. Randolph as President and a Charles Thompson of Philadelphia as Secretary of Congress. With much applause, we produced our commissions and spent the day discussing which sort of vote each colony should enjoy, an apparently sensitive topic amongst our brethren of the smaller eastern colonies. The following morning, I made haste to remind the Congress that proportional representation is most fit for keeping democracy pure. After all, our treatment by Great Britain has reduced us to a state of nature. The distinctions which once divided us are no more. I'm not a Virginian, but an American. Well, there are those who disagree. Perhaps I spoke prematurely, as you know I'm often prone to do. In any event, it was agreed that each colony would have one vote, if for no other reason than that of unity. At about the middle of that day, a messenger with news of a British attack upon Boston interrupted us. After an hour or two, we gathered ourselves, reassembled, and formed committees to state our grievances and to examine the possibility of trade restrictions. The following morning, after having heard a reading of the Psalms by Reverend Duchesne and fervent prayers for Boston, and indeed all of America, we retired to committee work. Although the cannonade report proved untrue, we learned that General Gage had in fact confiscated ammunition near Boston. Progress was exceedingly slow in Congress, but by the end of September, we agreed upon both non-exportation and non-importation. Rit Lee ruffled not a few feathers when he suggested that since those intolerable acts were held to be for our defense, well, perhaps we could relieve the Parliament of that expense by preparing our own militia. I joined him in reminding the Congress of our present state of nature. Gentlemen, all government is dissolved as is evidenced by the continued presence of His Majesty's fleets and armies, and the call to arms is in order, here, here. as the present measures lead to war. There was much debate upon those things. My patience at times wore thin, but John Adams was quick to remind us of the importance of unanimity. But when asked to draft a petition to the king, well, I dutifully complied. And as expected, it was rejected as too harsh and rewritten by John Dickinson. Finally, by the end of October, we signed our associations, agreed to reconvene the following May, if necessary, and said our farewells. Afterwards, Mr. Adams produced a letter from a Joseph Hawley of Massachusetts, which I shall not soon forget. In it, 
Mr. Hawley proclaimed that it is now or never that we must assert our liberty. By God, I am of that man's mind. As I've heard it has been said by Dr. Ben Franklin, make yourself sheep and the wolves will eat you. Having left our proxies with Colonel Washington and Mr. Lee, the others and I returned to Virginia. In November, my brother-in-law, Will Christian, you all know, returned with the glorious news of triumph over the Shawnee savages, and we went about the business of gathering our Hanover County militia. By now, most of our Virginia brethren have formed militias and committees of safety. In January, I received an encouraging letter from Silas Dean in Connecticut that the Eastern militias have also attained respectable footing. Mr. Dean predicts that America will and must be the most independent country on the globe. And I believe that the inevitable hostilities will not be borne by us alone. Where is France? Where is Spain? And where is Holland? Will Louis the 16th be asleep all this while? Gentlemen, believe me, he will not. You're all aware of the recent loss of my wife, Sally. Your prayers and thoughts during her prolonged illness were greatly appreciated. Her death left me a distraught old man for a time. But when I received word from the old speaker that we were to meet to elect delegates to the next Congress, and for other purposes of public security, I gathered myself and made my way along with my brother, you all know, John Sim, to Richmond, a location we discreetly chose to avoid Dunmore and his Tory friends. We had three days of discussion concerning the work of the previous Congress, but on this bitter cold last Thursday, the 23rd of March, I felt the time was right. With our militia laws expired and our governor's remissness in calling together the Burgesses, I proposed that our colony be put immediately into a posture of defense and that we form militia. Ridley seconded the motion and as expected, Mr. Pendleton, Mr. Bland and Colonel Harrison repeated their arguments well rehearsed in Philadelphia. And as requested, I shall now share with you my deeply felt response to those arguments. Mr. Johnson, why don't you be Peyton Randolph for the next few minutes? Thank you, sir. Mr. President, no man thinks more highly than I of the patriotism, as well as abilities of the very worthy gentlemen who have just addressed this house, but different men often see the same subject in different light. Therefore, I hope it will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if entertaining as I do opinions of a character very opposite to theirs, I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the House is one of awful moment to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery and in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time through fear of giving offense, I should consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country and of an act of disloyalty toward the majesty of heaven which I revere above all earthly kings. Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. But is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? <laughs> Are we disposed to be of the number of those who having eyes see not and having ears hear not the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. 
I know of no way of judging of the future, but by the past, and judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last ten years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves in this house. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir, to prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Here. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us to submission? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir. She has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we've been trying that for the last ten years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? We've nothing. We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, but it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? What terms shall we find which have not been already exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, and we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded. And we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne. In vain, after these things, may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve inviolate, those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending. If we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, in which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon, until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained, we must fight! Yeah. I repeat it, sir, we must fight! Yeah. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that has left us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be the next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution? and in action? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemy shall have bound us hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Amen. Three millions 
armed in the holy cause of liberty. And in such a country as that which we possess, are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone, but to the vigilant and the active and the brave. So true. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable. And let it come. I repeat it, sir. Let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it the gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear? Or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it! Almighty God! I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty! Or give me death. Thank you, gentlemen. Your humble servant, Patrick Henry. <laughs>